it is said that the smallest of efforts can change the world. And proof of that is something out there so small that it works from sunrise to sunset to preserve its own species and enrich those around it. From flowers to the very food we eat, one of the smallest creatures that we can see works tiredless to hunt, store, and feed their family, all while protecting their queen. Few creatures hold such mysteries and intrigue as the honeybee. While it seems almost impossible that the honeybee has not always been here, the truth is that they were introduced by original colonist farmers who came here in the 1600s. There's thousands of different types of uh, bees in the world. Um, and a lot of them have the same purposes, you know, that they're uh, gathering nectar and pollinating plants. But we didn't have the honeybee, per se, here in the United States until the early 1600s when the Europeans came over and started settling this area. Honeybees were common over in Europe and they brought that over with them on those boats. Um, obviously they housed them different than we do today, but they brought those uh, to the United States uh, roughly around like 1622, around that time frame. At that time, honey was uh, a valuable commodity and was also used in trade. So it was valuable to have. At that time, a lot of the uh, settlers, homesteaders had hives and it was a valuable thing to have. Due to the natural landscape of America, the honeybee would thrive, finding homes to build their hives in everything from dead trees to stacks of wood. To establish legal ownership of the hives, pioneers would carve their initials into the tree that contained the hive. This was common practice through the early 1800s in the Michigan Territory and throughout the United States. While Michigan homesteaders began clearing the forest for cultivation, bee trees could be kept maintained on location, split open for removal of the honey and bees, or cut apart transported to places where other such nests have been established. Known as the father of modern beekeeping, Reverend Lorenzo Langstroth developed a 10-frame, removable frame hive, which revolutionized the beekeeping industry. This hive system is still used today by many beekeepers all over the world. While today it is easy to select items made from honey on the store shelves, some beekeepers have elected to tend to their own bees, providing fresh honey for family and friends. It's outdoors. It kind of fits our lifestyle, and we don't have neighbors, so we don't have to worry about neighbors complaining about the bees or kids getting into them or pets getting into the bees. And the only problem was we had no idea how to start it, what to do, how to get into it. So we were searching online, and lo and behold, we find at the uh, Pine River Nature Center, which is like five miles down the road from us, they have a bee club that meets once a month, year-round, with informational stuff. And we as well, there's a, there's a source of information for us, so that'll be helpful. Now, where are we going to get all the stuff we need for beekeeping? So we're looking online, and we find out that in Avoca, which is a little country town out here, there's a bee supply store just starting up. They haven't even got their building yet, but they're doing stuff out of their house. So we contacted them, ordered our bees, got a couple of books from the library, started going to bee club meetings in the wintertime, and it's taken off from there. Other beekeepers have turned their hobby into successful businesses, helping large agricultural companies to pollinate their crops with the use of the beekeeper's bees. I run Murdoch's Raw Honey. I run an apiary with several apiaries. Anywhere from 10 to 20 hives on every location I have. In my experience, a lot of those orchards have enough on their plate. So they'd rather uh, hire a beekeeper to come in and they pay a fee for that pollination service. And it's worked out individually between the beekeeper and you know the manager or owner of the orchard. And uh, it, it is amazing, depending on what um, particular crop it is, how much uh, more production they get out of that orchard by having bees. While you may have a hard time finding someone who does not know what honey is, the mystery of how exactly the bee community produces it is less known to most. Honey hives that are not used for the queen's eggs 
are filled with nectar and pollen collected by the bees. Over a short period of time, these nectars ferment, creating a thick gooey substance that we know as honey. For bees, it is a substance of food for over the winter months, but for us and many other animals, it is simply a sweet, tasty treat. The eggs that she lays, that the queen lays, your workers are all females. Workers are unfertilized eggs. Workers from, from egg to when, they're, when they hatch and become a working bee in the hive is 21 days. So she lays that egg, it's an egg for three, four days, and then it's uh, into a larvae and then it gets capped. And then when they hatch in 21 days, every worker has a, a life cycle during the summer, at least about 41 days until it dies from the time it hatches. So it has a task throughout that 41 days. So when, they, when a worker first hatches, its job is to clean out the cell it was just in. So it cleans out that cell and prepares it for that queen to come back and put another egg in there. Then it's in the hive for you know roughly seven days where it has a task where it tends to the queen. So they have a process throughout that 41 days where like say a week they're attending inside there. And then after that week for a couple days, they may be soldiers where they're working the front and checking who's coming in. And then a couple weeks after that, there'll be foragers where they're going out and, and collecting pollen or nectar or water or resins or whatever they have a task to do. And they do that until the day they die. Once she is completely bred and satisfied that she has enough in her, she'll come back to the hive and just stay in the hive until she feels like the hive is no longer an acceptable place to live due to a number of reasons. Crowding is the biggest one, but parasites, mites, and things like that can also cause the queen to want to leave. And then she will fly away then, but only because of a stressful situation. Once she's home, she just stays there. With so many bees and so many hives, one has to wonder just how does a bee find his way home after foraging? A good, strong queen omits this pheromone moving throughout the hive and, and when she moves throughout that hive that pheromone gets spread throughout the hive and then the other bees actually will touch her and then carry that pheromone and that pheromone is throughout that box that is their their call sign her pheromones are different than you could have a box right next to her and that queen's pheromones are different they can smell or, or sense the difference in them it's so different in the sense that if you had two boxes right next to each other and a worker was coming back from the field and went into the other box, there's soldiers there that would stop, smell that bee, and like a lot of times identify this, you're not part of our group. So that whole pheromone is throughout that box. There is a time when the hive, if that queen starts getting old and not producing eggs, that they will supersede her. They'll raise new queens. They don't usually just raise one. They'll raise a whole bunch of queen cells at one time. And then sometimes she's either kicked out or, or disposed of. And then when those new queens hatch, once one of them hatches, she'll go and try to kill all the rest of the queens that are in there. So the strongest survive. And then that, that new virgin queen has to go out and do a mating flight and then come back to that hive. And then she starts the whole process over again where she's laying and that's her job. And you can actually see those workers that towards the end of their 41 days, give or take, is they actually work themselves to death. You can see the, their wings are tattered and beat up and they actually work to the point where they, they can't even get back to the hive. The drones or males are fertilized eggs. So when they lay, when she lays about 10% of that population, they're drones. And that's a way of her pushing her genetics out into the field. The drones don't do anything other than mate, so they're not gonna carry them through the winter. So she stops laying drone eggs, and they actually, those drones, will kick them out in the fall because they don't wanna have to feed them. So um, I know it sounds kind of harsh. The workers will clip the wings off those male bees, the drones, and push them out of the box so they can't fly back up and clip their wings. So Mother Nature's cruel, but it's, it's the way it works.
While the bees follow Mother Nature's plan to help protect themselves over the winter, many other creatures rely on the bees for their survival. To the beekeeper, these creatures can substantially reduce the bee population in the hive as well as in nature. Varroa mites are probably the biggest problem in beekeeping today because they're so destructive and they're so easy to move and they're so populous and once they get in a hive it's hard to completely eradicate them. You can kind of control them but it's really hard to eradicate them. It's about the size of a pinhead that attaches to the honeybee and that mite actually takes uh, blood and, and fat stores out of that honeybee and weakens it. Um, sometimes to the point of killing that bee. But when it does this, they're also, those mites are vectors for disease. So a lot of disease pathogens can be introduced to the honeybee or introduced to that hive that when you think about um, these mites build up all spring and summer long. And then as the bee population comes down in the fall, um, the mite load is higher than it was all year. And then you put those honeybees into winter in a weakened state. So if you can imagine this, this, you know, I can, the honeybee, the hive is a superorganism. So you're putting that whole body of bees in a weakened state, and then you're going to lock them in. So it's like the perfect storm where they're dealing with cold, they're dealing with lack of foraging, and then you have this parasitic mite on you, you know, sucking your blood basically. Um, that is the demise, in my opinion, of bees. There's a, a little a thing called a wax moth, which normally they're not too bad if you have a healthy hive. But a wax moth will get into your hive and lay eggs, and then the larva will hatch and they'll actually destroy the comb, thus the word wax moth. They'll destroy the comb, which is made out of wax, create cocoons in there and, and just make the hive a miserable place to live. And that's one of the reasons why bees will, will swarm and leave a hive. Hive beetles is another one. Hive beetles are a fairly common pest in a hive, but again, a healthy hive can manage and control that. If I was to take a lid off my hives right now, I would probably see some little black beetles crawling around on the roof, which is normal, because that's the bees will kind of corral them out of the hive and up into an area that's not really gonna affect the hive at all. You have to consider them like livestock. If your, um, your chickens or cows or pigs were sick, you wouldn't just allow them to stay sick, you would treat them. And I started using some of the information principles that I found online in books and then started taking care of my bees differently and be, started to become very successful in keeping bees alive. No SEMA is a kind of a dysentery that they get that can, it happens a lot in the winter, can make them sick and kill a hive. As far as animals go, and we all know about bears and honeybees, Yogi loved it. Skunks is another one that'll sit outside a hive. Birds will leave, and I've seen birds sitting in the trees here and picking off my bees as they're flying back and forth, but that's kind of incidental. So it's, it's mostly the, the little parasites, the mites and things like that in the hive, not external things outside the hive. For some people, a main goal of bee management, bee keeping. Patty and I get honey, but it's not like our primary purpose in getting it. But if you don't take the honey, the hive can overfill and they'll swarm. So you have to take honey out. You have to make sure you leave room for your bees to make more honey and lay larva. So honey harvesting usually for us happens in late July when a box is pretty well, all the frames are full of comb and full of honey and it's all capped over because until it's capped, it's not, according to the bees anyway, it's not quite honey yet. So you wait till the frames are capped and then you know it's honey and you can take it. You cut the cap off of the wax that the bees put on there and you put it in this washing machine drum thing. And if you take it in late July, that gives the bees a chance to replace it for the winter. So I take it in late July. We have a machine, our bee club. One of the beauties of being a member of the bee club is I can use our honey extraction machine and not have to go buy one or rent one. You close it up and you spin it and the honey just slings out into the side of the drum and then gathers at the bottom. And you just one side, then the other side until so you get all your frames all spun out. You get all your honey gathered at the bottom. 
Then you put a bucket underneath the, the spigot and put a screen in there to get all the bits of wax and bits of bees that might be in there. Sometimes there's some larva in your honey. Um, so you're gonna get some, some immature bees in there that are gonna come spinning out too. So the screening catches a lot of the impurities and you gather that into, a, into buckets. And then we go buy one pound glass jars from the bee supply store and bottle it up into those and then let people in the area know that we've got honey for sale. While harvesting honey from the hive to the plate is a process that beekeepers have done for decades, a new process has been added to honey to bring back a practice that is centuries old. Not only is honey a wonderful addition to one's diet, but has been rediscovered as a medical treatment for wounds of all kinds. By sterilizing and filtering the honey to a higher level than food grade, medical honey is now used in hospitals worldwide. I first heard about medical honey um, really when I started working in the wound care center. Honey has been utilized in many different forms in healthcare, um, medicinal, and also just for their good health properties for thousands and thousands of years. You know, Greeks and um, Romans have been utilizing it for a very long time, but my own personal experience it started when I worked in the wound care center. Some of the reasons why they find that honey to be suitable in the wound care center itself is because it will draw fluid out of the wound, just making the wound bed more apt for healing. The second reason is because it has a high acid level. So again, it just allows the wound bed to have more oxygen, just making it not so um, convenient for bacteria to hang out there and cause problems within the wound. In reality, a lot of the things that we use in medicine are derived by plants and, and different things like that. So once you find something suitable that's economical, it just is able, especially in healthcare, to continue to grow with it. The hives we have out here are for educational purposes. We run a class out here every uh, third Tuesday of the month and the best training or learning in my um, experience is hands-on. You know, you can read it in a book or watch a video, um, but it's better to be inside the hive to be able to pull those frames out and show people what you're talking about. And I just think that people connect better with that when they're looking right at what's going on and then it makes sense to them. You know, you can, you can describe an egg or describe larvae or describe drones or workers or queens, but until they actually see it right up front in person, um, they're not sure what they're really looking at. So we use those hives out there as, as ed education for anybody that wants to come. I don't really think there's anything much else I can talk about about honeybees. They're fun to keep. It can be very frustrating when you think you're doing a good job and you lose your bees anyway. When I said about this, like, you're a real beekeeper if you get them through winter. <laughs> I've been doing this for like six years or so, and I have never got two hives through the winter. I've got one hive through, which is very frustrating because you think, oh, it worked good with this hive. Why didn't it work with that hive? What did I miss? What happened? Why, why the disparity in the success? To me, it's fun to collect the honey. I like honey, and I like to sell honey. And if you do it good, it, it does kind of pay for itself. But, you know if you don't have to lose your bees every year and have to rebuy them. That's, that's the big thing. It is said that the smallest of efforts can change the world. And as we have learned, the proof is something out there so small, yet so fascinating. Few creatures hold such mysteries and intrigue as the one and only the honeybee.